military intervention. Seems like everybody's got an opinion on it. But what is it? I mean, what is it really? What makes something a military intervention rather than just a war? Now when I say military intervention, you may immediately think of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, but in reality, military intervention is way older than all those. It's older than terrorists, national security. Well, maybe not the latter. Ironically enough, the US record of military intervention begins over 150 years ago in North Africa. I'm speaking of the First Barbary War. Fought over issues like hostages and piracy, the war proved inconclusive, but it was the first military intervention in American history, and the first time U.S. forces were sent overseas. The incomplete goal of the campaign? Replace the hostile monarch of Tripoli with his pro-U.S. brother. The most important aspect of the war? It showed that the U.S. was an international power. Now fast forward a few years to the Spanish-American and Mexican-American War. Both of these were fought for political ideals. Basically, the U.S. was afraid of them too much influence too close to home. The thing is, though, these generally aren't considered military intervention, just unnecessary wars. So what makes a military intervention? For the purposes of this presentation, we'll assume that a military intervention only includes instances in which one country attempts to radically alter or interfere with the affairs of another country. Moving on to the early 20th century, there really aren't a whole lot of military interventions. Sure, there are a lot of wars, but they just don't fit the definition of military intervention that we're using here. At least, not until you get to the middle of the century. That's where military intervention begins, from a traditional standpoint. Though it's not a true military intervention, I can't help but mention the 1953 Iranian coup here. A joint operation between the CIA and MI6, the coup restored the pro-Western Shah to the throne, removing the democratically elected leader. The entire episode ended up doing more harm than good, as it's been used to justify the 1979 Islamic Revolution. The revolution, and the hostage crisis which soon followed, cemented Iran as a dangerously anti-Western power. This is one of several instances in which a military intervention has ended up having the opposite of the desired effects in the long term. The first widely known military intervention the Bay of Pigs invasion was an effort by the U.S. to remove Fidel Castro, the pro-communist dictator of Cuba. The invasion, orchestrated by the CIA and approved by President Kennedy, ultimately failed and ended up making the situation worse. Now not only was there a communist dictator in Cuba, but he was convinced that the U.S. invasion was coming. He quickly made an alliance with the Soviet Union, and they brought missiles into Cuba just 90 miles from Florida. When the U.S. found out, the Cuban Missile Crisis began. Thus, a botched military intervention nearly caused World War III. So now we've seen a couple of examples of what can happen when military intervention goes really wrong. But what about when it doesn't? What about when it works? Skipping past the Korean, Vietnam, and Persian Gulf Wars, we move to September 11, 2001. It was a day that changed history for the worse. In one horrible moment, the U.S. perhaps felt more vulnerable than it ever had before. The world was never the same, but perhaps the most immediate consequences were two military interventions. Iraq, and Afghanistan. Though the stated motives of each war were different, both of them ended up being fought about national security. Iraq to remove alleged weapons of mass destruction, and Afghanistan to destroy Al-Qaeda bases located therein. Now, 
both of these military interventions worked, in theory. I mean, most of the terrorist bases in Afghanistan were eliminated. There are no more weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, if there were any at all to begin with. And there haven't been any new major terrorist attacks. So, why do people overwhelmingly regret these? Is it just because we don't know what would have happened if we hadn't? Is it out of some sense of guilt? Why do we almost unanimously regret military interventions whenever they happen, even when they appear to succeed? Proponents of military intervention say it's our duty. Our duty to interfere for the greater good, to protect our national security, the lives of our people, and the lives of others. But opponents say, the cost in American lives is too high. The cost in money is too high. And the fact is, it's simply not our place to interfere. But isn't it true that we already interfere? Didn't we go into Pakistan to eliminate Osama bin Laden? Don't we already do things that other countries couldn't get away with? Is that our duty? Is that our right? Or are we just stepping on everyone's toes because we can. Looking to the future, the confrontation with Syria appears inevitable. Could this be another military intervention on the brink? Would you support it? Will America support it? Does the cost of American lives justify staying out? Does the cost of Syrian lives justify going in? Will we regret it in 10 years if we do either one? These are questions that history will have to answer.